Hey there. How you doing, class? Sorry, I was a little busy there. Just, you know, analyzing some uh, primary sources on uh, my free time. You know, getting kind of crazy with that, you know, our history teacher role. Anyway, so uh, what are we doing right now? Oh, yeah, let's go look at our vocab. We have some vocab words to do. So we are looking at our chapter 2.2, the development of states and empires, the classical big three, China, India, and Rome. And our first word is on your list, and that is going to be centralized and decentralized governments. We're going to do both centralized and decentralized governments and China for this one. So have those both in your packet. Let's get to our first word. We're looking at those guys over there, and we are looking at centralized government. So if I'm going to define what a centralized government is, that is basically a government that is centrally controlled. See that guy right there? Centrally controlled. <clears throat> and power is distributed to other people. But the main part of power is in the center. We're going to see this in China with the Qin Dynasty, in Rome. This is where basically there's like an emperor or someone who is in charge. I mean, it could even be a president. But someone in the center, usually a capital city, is in charge of the entire government and it is basically ruled from the center, ruled from one city, ruled from one emperor. Very historically significant in the classical era because what we see in the classical era is the growth of centralized governments as they become bigger and bigger. So centralized governments grow, especially in Rome and China. We see some of this in India with the Mauryan and Gupta. It doesn't become as big. But we want to be especially thinking of the Qin Dynasty in China and the Roman Empire for centralized governments. Let's see what we got next. Decentralized governments is kind of the opposite. It's where like all the people on the outside have power. So in a centralized government, in a centralized, the emperor has a lot of power. In the classical era, in a decentralized government, the nobles or these people who rule chunks of land have a lot of power. They're called nobles or lords. They're not quite the emperor. They're the next people down. And they kind of rule like their own little states or little territories. So in a decentralized government, like the Zhou dynasty, Z-H-O-U, the lords and the nobles had a lot of power, and there's not one person mainly in charge. Uh, India will kind of go towards this because India never gets a... They have a centralized government for a while, but it kind of fades away, and it becomes more decentralized as local rulers rule more. So decentralized, local rulers rule more. Centralized, people who are like the emperor and the central government rule more. It'll be significant, especially with the Zhou dynasty, because the Zhou dynasty falls because the emperor loses his control because it's so decentralized that all these nobles and lords who rule their own little plots of land stop listening to the emperor, and it becomes a period of the warring states because they're not even listening to the emperor. Uh, okay, so that is what a decentralized government is. Let's move on to China. All right, East Asia, classical China vocab. And let's get to our first word, which is the Zhou Dynasty. First, the Zhou Dynasty is the second dynasty in China. It follows the Shang. And as I just mentioned, it is more of a decentralized dynasty. The emperor loses power, and the nobles and lords get a lot of it, which leads to what is called the period of warring states, where all these local rulers are trying to get control. So you have the Shang, and then you have the Zhou dynasty. Very famous for their metalworking. It is actually the longest lasting dynasty in China, but a lot of it had conflict, and this is where Confucius and uh, Lao Tzu wrote their text to try to get some peace involved. The Zhou dynasty does start to gain more territory, but um, uh, eventually it gets in the period of warring states, and it falls and is replaced by the Qin dynasty. Lastly, the Zhou dynasty is significant because it leads to the period of warring states, which causes the Qin dynasty to come in with a much more centralized government. It's also significant because it's the time period that brought us both Taoism and Confucianism. So now, let's take a look at over there what we got, and that is the period of warring states in China. So, we talked about decentralized power. So what happened was, all these states, pretty much, they start competing for power because the Zhou dynasty, it's not my dynasty, it's Zhou dynasty, <laughs> okay, anyway, so um, the Zhou dynasty becomes weak and eventually falls apart. So the period of warring states is when all of these states are competing. It's a chaotic time. There's fighting going on. 
This is a time period called feudalism, where pretty much local lords are just fighting back and forth. Most of the people are farming. It's not going well for them. And it's where, um, uh, like we talked about, it's very significant also because it brings Taoism and uh, Confucianism into China, which is a reaction against all this violence. And we see right here the Qin. And the Qin are going to become big players because they're going to win this battle. So let's get to our next word. The Qin Dynasty is a dynasty that does not last that long in China, but has a huge effect. The Qin Dynasty brings China together and ends the period of warring states. In fact, China is named after the Qin. So Shang, Zhou, Qin. So we have the Qin Dynasty, and the Qin Dynasty cannot be separated from its main ruler, Qin, Shir, Huang, Di. These two are going to kind of go together. Um, the Qin Dynasty pretty much lasts for one emperor, technically two, but there's Qin, Shir, Huang, Di, who's word number four on our list. So Qin Dynasty and Qin, Shir, Huang, Di, who's the emperor. He's the emperor of the Qin Dynasty. Now, he is a crazy control freak who runs a completely centralized government. He has control of everything, like the weights, how big the road should be, um, what kind of writing should be used. They start burning the books of Confucian scholars because they protest against the Qin Dynasty and start killing the Confucian scholars at this time, too. However, they are able to unite people brutally. They will murder people if you speak out against the emperor, uh, if you speak out against him. But they're able to unite China. They, build, they start building the first, the first time the Great Wall gets built. The Great Wall is going to keep getting built over and over and over and over again in Chinese history. But they first start building the Great Wall to defend themselves against outsiders. It is a brutal dynasty that lasts only about like 20 to 30 years. We'll get the technical years in a little bit here. But um, uh, it is a brutal dynasty that unites China together. I'll give you those years, 221 to 206 BCE for the Qin Dynasty. And there we see the emperor, the brutal, brutal, that guy's a brutal emperor. Um, but very effective at bringing China together, bringing one language for China. Again, all the roads have been measured the exact same length. He was able to increase trade for China but he brutally suppressed anyone who was against him, especially Confucian scholars. <clears throat> so, China is brought together forcibly under Qin Shi Huangdi. He also builds a huge-ass tomb of terracotta warriors, which you'll see in a video. And these terracotta warriors were to die with him so he would be protected in the afterlife. He also was drinking mercury because he wanted to find the elixir of life that would make him live forever. And ironically, mercury is poisonous. He was taking the small doses. And that might also have made him go what we would technically call fucking crazy. And might be why he was so like brutal to everyone and paranoid of people around him. Um, eventually he does die. Um, his son takes over. But his son is violently taken out the throne and replaced by the Han Dynasty. All right, let's talk legalism here uh, a bit. So um, legalism pretty much is following, like this thing says obey, I kind of like this picture for it. Um, it is basically um, follow exactly what you're supposed to. Follow the law 100%. Don't break the law at all, not even a little bit, ever. Legalism was followed by Qin, Shi, Huangdi, and the Qin Dynasty. We had Confucianism, we had Taoism, but they wanted legalism, which was pretty much follow what Qin, Shi, Huangdi says. Follow the law no matter what, and if you don't, you'll be punished possibly killed. And it was the idea that pretty much people aren't that good and that the ruler needs to tell them exactly what to do. This is pretty historically significant because this leads people to build the Great Wall. They have to do it. It makes people totally follow the Qin Dynasty. And legalism, because people follow it, actually first really unites China. And that's why many people call Qin Shi Huangdi the first emperor how, with how he ruled under legalism. Our next word is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy pretty much is having people who work for you and your institution. Here we'll talk about like the government. It's basically having like different levels of people who have different jobs in the government. And it does start off in the Qin Dynasty, but bureaucracy really grows in the Han Dynasty. And bureaucracy pretty much means you want trained professionals, professionals handing, handling the different kind of jobs. Uh, when the Han Dynasty comes back, this will be significant because a bureaucracy will be established based on exams that follow Confucianism 
and they use Confucianism for their education system, and to try to get the best possible people they can for their jobs. So it's like different levels of people in different jobs, and you try to get the best trained people to do your jobs. Bureaucracy, we see it all the time today, different levels. Like many of you, the jobs you work at, you see bureaucracy, different levels of people, managers, and different levels and everything. At your job, you're probably near the bottom. But anyway, there's bureaucracy in jobs today, many in Han China. It was historically significant because it allowed China to run their government efficiently for centuries, starting with the Qin Dynasty into the Han, into the dynasties that would follow out of the classical era. The Great Wall of China. This is a project that goes on and on and on in Chinese history. It's uh, started by the Qin Dynasty in the classical era and continued by the Han Dynasty. The goal of the Great Wall is to keep outside nomadic fighters out of China. And these outside nomadic fighters keep fighting China because they're nomadic. They live a totally different way of life with China. They have more agriculture. Here they're more um, nomadic pastoral people like the Shan Nu, the Huns, and the later the Mongols who will fight against China. And the Great Wall of China is built to keep these outsiders out. Started by Qin Shi Huangdi, many people died, especially when he was in charge of building it through legalist practices, continues in the Han, and it will go all the way up to the Ming Dynasty much, much later in our course. Uh, does it work? Eh, kind of, but outside, event, outside invaders do eventually get into China, but it does keep them out too, so it's a, a mixed success. Significant because many people had to build it, and it also shows that China was always having fighting against nomadic people who were north of their border. Terracotta warriors, these are really cool. These are buried in the city of Xi'an, X-I apostrophe A-N. Um, these were buried with the Qin Emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. These are life-size warriors, all who have unique designs for their faces, individually made, that were buried with him in his huge tomb, which also had like a river of mercury in there, and it was to go on with him in the afterlife. And we see there were even horses that were made. And the terracotta warriors are historically significant because they're really showing just how powerful Qin Shi Huangdi was and what he could get done through his legalist practices. Han Wu Di. He's an emperor in the Han Dynasty. So Han Wu Di was the longest lasting emperor of the Han Dynasty, ruled over a period that was mostly stable when he was ruling there. And like many Han emperors, he was able to establish an effective bureaucracy using Confucianism. Um, was able to have established a strong centralized government in the Han Dynasty, which lasted in two periods for 400 years. So he was a mostly effective ruler in China during the Han Dynasty. Historically significant because the Han Dynasty continues to expand China, gets connections to the Silk Road, and becomes a big trading partner and grows as a dominant classical empire. All right, see what's happening here? Han Dynasty, our next word. What it keeps happening to China's territory? It keeps expanding. So this is modern day China throughout here. But we see it keeps expanding. And with the Zhou, the Qin, and the Han, in the classical era, China keeps getting bigger. The Han Dynasty uh, basically expands China, gets connected to the Silk Road, brings in wealth, establishes a bureaucracy based on Confucianism, and is a very strong dynasty in China and rules for about 400 years. It's a pretty good run for dynasties. Um, it is a dominant dynasty of the classical era, pretty much rivals the Roman Empire at this time for who was the most powerful. You could flip a coin for whichever one you think was more powerful. And it is a dominant dynasty in China. All right, that's all we got now. Mr. Wood will go back to his corner and let's go investigate some more primary sources. Ooh, we got some Aristotle here. I'm liking it. Maybe we should start conquering stuff. All right, see you guys later.